Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Imagine that your perfect family life is suddenly shattered because of one anonymous letter. What will you do when you find out that the person you trusted most has betrayed you? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy! Wow, that hurt. I stumbled back, dropping my drinks. She hit me so hard that it felt like she could have dislocated my jaw. His left hand reached to his face, trying to erase the pain. I really think she might have dislocated my jaw. It hurts and clicks when I open and close my mouth. I looked around the room, confused. Everyone was staring at me. I glanced at my wife. Rage was burning in her eyes. She was furious. I didn't understand where this anger came from. Ten minutes ago, we were laughing and chatting at a party celebrating the 30th anniversary of the company I work for. When I say my company, I don't mean that I own it. It's where I've been working for 25 years since I graduated from college. I'm the director of operations, the owner's right hand. We have worked hard to get where the company is today. It's been 10 years since the last corporate party. Our last holiday was the company's 20th anniversary. 10 years ago, I didn't know if I would stay here for another month, let alone a decade. It had nothing to do with work then. My personal life was in complete confusion, and I did not know what to do next. I didn't know what would happen or where I would end up. At that time, I thought about divorce. I had just received an anonymous email from someone at my wife's corporate office. The letter was addressed to me and someone named Elizabeth Jones. I was curious why I received an email from Bridget's company. I opened the letter and my life instantly changed. In the photo, my wife was kissing some man. They were standing in front of the door of a hotel room. I remember every detail of this photo, my wife's blue business dress, her hand resting on the back of the man's head. This was not a random photo, they were in the arms of lovers. The door framed the picture of my wife's betrayal. Room number 321 was clearly visible. It wasn't my wife's room. I checked, and it was registered in the name of Gary Jones. The most annoying thing was that when I tried to find out what room my wife had booked, it turned out that there was no room. I'll find out more details later. I had to quit my job to figure this out. I went to Jim, the owner, and asked for permission to leave and take the next day, Friday, off. He knew something was wrong but didn't ask, at least not then. When I got home, I took the kids to Bridget's parents. We needed to talk, and I didn't want the kids to hear the words I was about to say. When Bridget got home, it was about 6.30. Her flight landed at about 5.15, and after picking up her car from the long-term parking lot, she made the 45-minute drive home. Bridget is a regional representative for a company based in Chicago. She works from home, which allows her flexibility between work and child care, but she has a three-day meeting at the main office once a quarter. This was one of those meetings. When Bridget walked through the garage door, she was carrying a suitcase in one hand and holding a purse in the other. I stood in the kitchen and looked at her. She said, Oh Kurt, can you get my suitcase out of the trunk? No. You might need to leave it there someday, I told her. She looked up at me, embarrassed. She realized that I was angry. What happened, dear, she asked, concerned. You're lying, cheating, I shouted, holding the printed photograph. There were others, but this one was the most convincing. She gasped, where did you get this? Someone in your group cares more about our marriage than you do. They sent this to let me know what's going on, I said. Her face became emotionless. We stood in silence for at least a minute. That's not true, Kurt, she finally said. What do you think this is? A fake photo? What's not true? It's not true that anyone in my group cares more about our marriage than I do, she said. Damn it! I shouted. Get your cheating fifth place back in the car, go to the hotel, to your parents, or to hell if you want. Kurt! We need to talk about this. You know I love you and the kids more than anything in this world. You need to know that. To hell with you. It doesn't look like this in the photo. If you were in love, you would never be with him. You have to leave now. Kurt, this does not diminish my love for you and the children. If you look into your heart, you will know that I love you. You have a strange way of showing it, sleeping with another man when you're not at home. 
you have to go. I can't stand the sight of you now. No, I'm not leaving. We need to talk about this. You need to let me explain, she said. I don't want to listen to you. If you don't leave, then I will, I said and left the house. I went out to the garage to get into my truck. Bridget had already left the kitchen and headed into the garage. She walked around to the driver's side of the car as I was getting in. Kurt, she said, stop. No. I shouted and started the engine, roaring to drown out her voice. I threw the car into reverse, and she jumped out of the way as I screeched out of the garage. I pulled out onto the street, changed gear, and drove away. My heart was racing as I drove down the street. Asterisk she thinks she can get out of this? No way, asterisk. At that moment, my phone rang. Of course, it was her. I didn't want to talk to her. I wanted to throw my phone out the window, but I needed it for calls and internet access, so I turned it off, not wanting to be disturbed by her or anyone else. I went to Spring Hill. My wife could try calling all the hotels in Columbia, Tennessee, where we lived, but she wouldn't think to call the hotels in Spring Hill. While I was driving, I was thinking about who Gary Jones was and how long this had been going on. Apparently, Gary was also married. The letter was sent to both Elizabeth Jones and me and said, These are pictures of what your spouses are doing. Did they plan to leave us? Perhaps they were just waiting for the right moment to tell us. Well, that might have sped up their plans. Many thoughts were spinning in my head. I needed to investigate and find out as much as possible. I needed information to formulate a plan of action. I found a hotel and checked in. I didn't have any luggage, a change of clothes, or even a toothbrush. I went to Walmart and bought what I needed, plus a pair of jeans and a polo to change into tomorrow. I didn't buy too much, only what I could pay for in cash. I didn't know when I'd get home, but I didn't want to use my debit card in case Bridget came looking for me. On the way back to the hotel, I bought pizza and sat on the bed, barely tasting it. Bridget, my wife for now, had cheated on me. How long had this been going on? Had they shared a room? I wondered. I began to remember our marriage. I know husbands are often the last to know and might not notice the signs, but I really couldn't recall anything that would make me doubt her fidelity. I searched the internet for signs of cheating. None of the signs listed were present. There were no accusations or even hints that she considered me unfaithful. There were no late-night calls or messages that she would receive in another room or on the street. She didn't change her appearance or habits. We talked about our days and even made time for each other. There was no decline in our activity. In fact, even 15 years after marriage, we were having intimacy an average of five times a week. I really didn't see any signs of her cheating. In fact, if you had asked me two days ago, I would have said that I was the happiest person in the world. I had a wife whom I loved, who loved me, and three children ages 7, 10, and 12, who made our lives even richer. I thought about the children, Jared, the eldest, followed by Jeremy, and finally Jennifer. Yes, I know all their names begin with the letter J. Perhaps we shouldn't have named the children that way, but we did. It probably made things worse because my last name is Jensen. Jared quickly became JJ because of this so we insisted that the others be called by their full names, Jeremy and Jennifer. How would they take this? I didn't know what the future held, but I wanted to be their father no matter what. If we decided to divorce, I insisted that they not be transferred to another location. I wanted to continue to play an important role in my children's lives. Divorce? Do I want a divorce? No, of course not. I wanted a loving marriage with a loving wife and family. I don't think any man with a family wants a divorce. What could I do? I couldn't live with a wife who chooses to sleep with another man. I wondered again who this Gary Jones was. I needed to do some research. I googled it. There were many Gary Joneses, but only one worked for my wife's company. He was also a regional representative for the company, and his area of responsibility included Denver. So every three months, they were at quarterly meetings together. I knew he was married, so I started looking him up on Facebook to find out more about him. It took a while, but I finally found Gary Jones from Denver with his wife Elizabeth. 
They have two children, a six-year-old boy and an eight-year-old girl. I wondered how she would take the news. Would she divorce him, making him a partial father? I found her Facebook page and sent her a friend request. I assumed she would recognize my name from the letter and hopefully accept the request. I needed to talk to her, or rather have a Facebook conversation. I needed to know more. I took my fourth beer and sat back on the hotel bed. How did my life go to hell? I asked myself. Was it my fault that she cheated? I tried to be an involved parent and a loving husband. I brought her flowers from time to time, even for no reason, simply because I loved her. What did I do wrong? I knew I couldn't find the answers to these questions without talking to Bridget, but the wound was too raw to talk to her tonight. Maybe I could talk to her tomorrow, or maybe not until next week. As I thought about this, I thought about my children again. I had taken them to their grandparents so we could sort things out. We didn't talk long before I couldn't stand it anymore. What did she say? It's not true that anyone from corporate thinks more about our marriage than I do. How could she say that? If she truly cared about our marriage, she wouldn't cheat on me. Then she said, You know that I love you and the children more than anything in this world. You should know that. How can I know this if she is sleeping with another man? Then she had the audacity to say, This does not diminish my love for you and the children. If you look into your heart, you will know that I love you. That's the problem. When I look into my heart, I really know that she loves me, she loves us all. How could she do this? Doesn't she realize that by doing this, she has actually diminished her love? She took away the trust one had in her. How will I ever trust her again? The children were with her parents. What will she tell them? What will she tell her parents? Will she lie about why I brought the kids? Will she lie to the children when they return home? No, I knew she wouldn't lie. Bridget was honest as day. She would rather not say anything or promise to tell later. No, she won't lie, and that's another thing that bothered me. How could a person who so insistently avoids lying be so dishonest in a relationship? If I did something that caused her to turn to another man, shouldn't she have told me? There were more questions I wanted to ask her during the conversation. I wasn't much of a drinker, so the fourth beer started to put me to sleep. I knew my sleep would be restless, the beer would help with this. I probably slept for about four hours, mostly thanks to the beer. I kept waking up, dreaming about my life as a divorced father. When the light outside became bright enough to disturb my sleep, I got up, showered, and put on new clothes. I turned on my phone and saw more messages from Bridget, both voice and text. She was worried and wanted to know where I was. I didn't want to deal with it now. I decided to go to Cracker Barrel for breakfast. I sat alone, watching the other diners in the dining room, young families enjoying their meals, little ones getting dirty and throwing food around, some people like me sitting alone engrossed in their phones, and an elderly couple sitting across from each other, talking with love and familiar intimacy in their eyes. This couple brought tears to my eyes. I had been so stoic up until this point but seeing them made me remember my dreams when I married Bridget. My dream was to grow old together. I quickly finished eating and left. I drove through the countryside, thinking about my dreams and our dreams when Bridget and I met during our senior year at the University of Tennessee. I knew it was love at first sight. She was so beautiful and well-groomed, with brown hair, jeans, and a white blouse. I remember every detail. We started dating and soon became an exclusive couple. We graduated from the university and got married a year later. I was all smiles standing at the altar in her church. My family, my parents and my brother and his wife, traveled from Franklin, Indiana, to attend. I also had a few friends from college, and my best friend since childhood was the best man. I still remember our promises to each other, to love, honor, and cherish. This is another thing I can't understand about Bridget's behavior. If there was one aspect of Bridget that I found a little strange, it was her attitude towards promises. She never gave them lightly. If she made a promise, she would definitely keep it, even if it went against her interests. She felt so strongly that a promise was absolutely sacred to her. How could she promise me to love, honor, and cherish, and then cheat on me? It made me question everything I knew about her. I continued to drive around. 
Tennessee is such a beautiful state, from the mountains in the east to the Mississippi River in the west. Nature is everywhere. It's a stark contrast to Indiana's mostly flat farmland. I definitely consider Tennessee my home state now. Even though I was enjoying the scenery, my thoughts kept returning to the problem. When I stopped to gas up my car, I saw even more text messages and voicemails. I knew from the tone of the messages that she was concerned that I might have done something to myself. I needed to let her know that I was alive, but I didn't want to give her any hint that I had read or listened to her messages. Rather than let her think that I had deleted them, I decided to call JJ. We bought him a phone for his 12th birthday. I dialed his number, and he answered on the third ring. Hey, Dad, what's going on? Why do you ask? I said. Mom called here twice last night and again this morning, he said. So, are you still at your grandparents? Yeah, Mom said we can stay the night and skip school today. I think she'll come pick us up after lunch. So what's going on? Your mom and I had a fight, and I spent the night at a hotel. You don't have to worry about that. Don't say anything to Jeremy or Jennifer, it'll only bother them. Okay, Dad. What should I tell Mom when she comes to pick us up? Tell her I'll text her later. Okay, Dad. Yes, son. I hope you can work things out. I'm sure we will, son, I said, but I wasn't really sure. I wasn't sure of anything. About an hour later, my phone rang. I thought she would call me as soon as she arrived at her parents' place, and JJ would give her my message. In fact, that's what I was counting on. I let the call go to voicemail and listened to the message. She sounded relieved but still worried and a little annoyed. Well, she'll be furious when she gets home. I parked at my house, drove into the garage, and entered the house. I immediately started packing all my clothes and other things I might need. When I say packing, I really mean throwing my stuff into trash bags so I could get it out to the truck as quickly as possible. I took my laptop and a photo we took of my three kids last year. I placed my wedding ring on the nightstand on her side of the bed. I wrote a letter to my children telling them I loved them and put it on the kitchen table. What made me cry was that I had to write all my feelings for my children in a letter. I will compensate them for this someday. After I wiped away my tears, I walked out to the truck, backed out of the garage, and pressed the button to close the garage door. I watched it go down. It was like closing a door to my life. About half an hour later, Bridget called me again. I decided to answer the call. Yes? I said in an indifferent tone. Kurt, what does this mean, were her first words to me, not I'm sorry or please forgive me. What does it mean? I asked again indifferently. A note to the kids, you took all your clothes, and I found your wedding ring on my nightstand. You seem to have described everything correctly. Why do you need me to explain this to you? I said sarcastically. I was rarely sarcastic with my wife, but when I was, she knew I was angry. Kurt, we need to talk. You shouldn't leave so impulsively. Oh, so that's the thing. He has twice as much as I do. Is that what you see in him? Kurt, we need to talk, she repeated. That's what we say, right? I said sarcastically. No, we need to talk face to face. You need to go home. Where are you anyway? Somewhere where I can think about my life and the direction I want to take it, somewhere where I don't have to see my cheating wife. She started to get angry. Kurt, come home now. Bridget, I'm not one of our children. You can't talk to me like that. Goodbye, I said loudly and hung up. I turned off the phone and let her call voicemail. Let her yell at me. I knew I was being difficult, but she never said she was sorry. Those should have been the first words she spoke. She showed no remorse, on the contrary, she was full of rage. I went to a motel that rented rooms for the week and rented a room. Later, I would decide where I would live. Lying on the bed, I started thinking again. I wondered what she told her parents. Her parents had always treated me well, they seemed to really love me. I needed to call them and tell them my side of the story. I took the phone and turned it on. There was no point in listening to voicemails or looking at text messages, I knew there would be more of the same. 
I wondered if she'd ever say she was sorry or if it would be a half-hearted apology. I dialed her parents' number, and her mom answered. Helen, this is Kurt. Oh, Kurt. Thanks for calling. We were so worried about you, she said. I felt more love from her now than from her daughter. Thanks, I'm fine. So what did she tell you? I asked. She said you had a huge misunderstanding and that you left before she could explain. She was sure that once you talked, everything could be worked out. Misunderstanding? That's putting it mildly, I thought. So she didn't give any details? No, she just said you were exaggerating everything. Well, then let me give you some details, and you can decide if I'm exaggerating. Okay, Kurt. If it helps you take the weight off your mind, I'm listening. It turns out that Bridget, my wife, and your daughter cheated on me. Oh, Kurt, I can't believe it. Well, they sent me pictures, one of which is of her in a very passionate kiss in front of a hotel room door. There must be some logical explanation. Kurt, I can't believe she could do that. I couldn't believe it either. So I called the hotel and asked for her number, and they told me she didn't make a reservation. I know this is the hotel her company uses for all their guests because it's right down the street from the main office. Well, maybe there was a mistake, her mother said. That doesn't explain why she was hugging and kissing that Gary Jones guy, I said. When I mentioned his name, I heard her sigh. What do you know? I asked. Oh, Kurt, are you sure it was him? Well, the letter I received was addressed to me and Elizabeth Jones, and the number was registered to Gary Jones. The letter said they were cheating. Oh, Kurt, I'm so sorry. Well, at least someone is sorry, I said. So who is Gary Jones? How does she know him? Does he live in Denver? Kurt, Gary was Bridget's first love. They were high school sweethearts. We were sure they would get married. Bridget went to the University of Tennessee, and Gary went to the University of Colorado on a scholarship. He wanted to leave Tennessee, but they stayed in touch throughout the entire first year. They called each other constantly. But in the summer, they decided that a long-distance relationship was too difficult for Bridget. I think it made her more independent, so she's still in love with him, and I was her second choice. No, Kurt. I know that she loves you. When she met you and we talked, you were the only one she talked about. Even in the difficult moments of the marriage, she always spoke about you with love. I know that she loves you and the children. Please talk to her and find out what's going on. I must admit that talking with Bridget's mother not only gave me new insights but also made me feel better, if only because I could share my experiences with someone. Thank you, Mom. Talking to you really helped me. I don't know what will happen, but I hope that no matter the outcome, we will still have a good relationship. Okay, Kurt. I believe you can work things out. Don't give up on your marriage. I believe you will regret it if you give in. Thanks, Mom. I'll think about it a lot. I hung up. She really made me wonder if this was worth fighting for. It's obvious she still cares about Gary Jones. The question that worried me was, what place do I occupy in her life? He was her first love. Are they planning to resume a serious relationship? Where will I and our children end up then? I needed to know how she felt about Gary Jones and our marriage. I texted Bridget, I'll come home tomorrow night around 6. That was all I wrote. She immediately responded, Okay. I love you. If she loves me, then why did she do this? I hope that tomorrow would clear up at least some of my questions. On Saturday night, I rang the doorbell at exactly six. JJ opened the door and looked at me puzzled. Dad, why did you ring the doorbell? I didn't know what to tell him. I did this to show Bridget that I no longer felt part of the family. Standing there looking at my son, I realized it was a mistake. I will always be part of the family regardless of divorce. JJ then said, Dad, I don't know what happened, but no matter what, you're my dad. My child was too wise for his age. I think he already understood something, even at 12 years old. Then Bridget came out of the kitchen. Kurt, honey, take off your coat. Dinner's almost ready. She cooked dinner and acted as if nothing had happened, 
as if it were just a normal day without any problems to deal with. This calmed me down, but at the same time, it made me angry. During dinner, I paid attention to my children. They seemed happy that I was home but didn't seem bothered by my absence. I think it was only two days, although it seemed longer to me. Throughout dinner, JJ watched me. He saw the tension on my face and the fact that I was not paying attention to his mother. After dinner, the whole family played a few games. I still hadn't interacted with Bridget. Before bed, I tucked the kids into their beds, even JJ. He told me, Dad, you always said that problems need to be discussed. Follow your own advice. My son challenged me and put me in an awkward position. I'll do it, son. Will you be here in the morning? We'll see. I hope so, I said. I really hope that we could find a way to overcome this. I just didn't know how. I went downstairs and into the living room. Bridget was sitting on the sofa. I sat down opposite her. We just looked at each other for a minute. Then she said, So, are you going to stop acting like a child and finally talk to me? So, her first words to me were not I'm sorry or I love you. Instead, she decided to insult me. This pissed me off. So how long have you and Gary been sleeping together? I asked. It was better to deal with this right away. Kurt, it's not like that, she said. So you're denying that you're sleeping with your ex-boyfriend? She looked down at her hands and then looked back at me. It's not like that, she repeated. Bridget, you've always been a very honest person. I want you to look me in the eyes and say yes or no when I ask you again. Are you sleeping with Gary Jones? Kurt, you need to let me explain. She avoided answering, trying to dodge the topic. I looked at her, and she just looked back at me. I didn't see any guilt, shame, or remorse on her face. That said it all. I stood up. She looked at me. I turned and headed toward the front door. So you're going to run away again? Why can't you stay and discuss this rationally? Because right now, I just want to wipe that look off your face. If I don't leave now, I'm afraid I might hit you, and I don't hit women, not yet. I put on my coat, opened the door, and walked out to my truck. She just showed me that my feelings don't matter to her. Again, I remember that she had never once said she was sorry. I got into the truck and drove out of the yard. I looked at the house and noticed JJ looking out the window. I left crying about my failed marriage and my children. On Monday, I called the lawyer to make an appointment. She was available at 4 o'clock, so I talked to Jim, the owner, and left work a little early. The lawyer met with me, and I explained the whole situation. She asked me if I thought we could work things out. I don't think so. She hasn't said she's sorry yet, and the look on her face on Saturday night showed that she doesn't feel any remorse. Okay, she said. I'll start the paperwork. I can have it ready for service on Friday. Where do you want her to be found and served? This could be a problem. She worked from home but saw clients throughout central Tennessee. How could I be sure that she would be home to be served with the documents? I explained the situation to Janice, and she offered to hand over the paperwork immediately after the kids got on the school bus. That works, she never leaves the house before they leave. Now, Mr. Titus Jensen, you understand that if you go through with a divorce, your wife will likely receive primary custody of the children and will be able to continue living in the house. You will likely be responsible for the mortgage, child support, and health insurance for the children. However, with her job, you probably won't have to pay child support. What a gut punch. The trader gets away with it, and I have to pay for it. Knowing all this, do you still want her to be served with documents? I looked at her, thought for a minute, and said, We may not get divorced, but she needs to understand the seriousness of the situation. Can I give you some advice? She asked. Of course. You're the expert. After the initial shock of being presented with the documents, she may agree to go to counseling. There, you can both voice your opinions with a moderator who can help keep the conversation constructive. Okay, I said. When she's served the paperwork, she'll probably call you immediately. Make sure you're prepared to take the call. If she seems conciliatory and asks how she can avoid divorce, suggest she go to counseling. 
If she agrees, let her choose a counselor so she can see that you're ready to follow her initiative in this matter. Okay, I said again. I probably looked like an idiot. Kurt, be open to what the counselor says. If I understand you correctly, you would rather stay in the marriage than get divorced. You just need to see her remorse and regain your self-respect. Having your wife acknowledge your pain and apologize will help you in this. I thanked her and left her office with trepidation. I was afraid of what the next week would bring. I cleared my schedule on Friday so that I would be available if Bridget called, and if she wanted to talk longer, I would be available too. At 8.15, she called. Kurt, she sobbed. I realized she was crying. I love you. I don't want a divorce. We promise till death do us part. Don't destroy everything. Think about the children. I will not stay married to you while you sleep with your ex-boyfriend, I said directly but not aggressively. Kurt, I'm sorry I hurt you. Wow, she did apologize, but she apologized for hurting me, not for what she did. At least that's what I heard. Please, Kurt, I love you. Please don't do this. She was now crying her eyes out. Bridget, you've probably hurt me more than you realize. I just don't see any way out of this. Oh, Kurt, please. Can't we talk about this? Try to work it out. She sobbed, if you stop humiliating me. Yes, I said. I needed to pry her off. I'm sorry, Kurt. I was just disappointed that you weren't willing to listen and try to understand. Perhaps we can go to a counselor. He can help us both understand. I suggested, would you go? Yes, but you choose a counselor. You know my schedule. Make arrangements and tell me where and when. I'll call you right away. Kurt, thank you. I really love you. I love you too, honey. So we are either on the verge of reconciliation or collapse. I really didn't know how it would end. What was I willing to accept? What was I willing to do? What about my children? If they really are my children, I hated to even think about it. But when someone betrays your trust, you start to doubt everything. I couldn't understand it. If you asked me even now if I think Bridget loves me, I would answer yes. She was everything you could hope for in a wife. She expressed her love for me in many ways. If she didn't love me, she would be the best actress in the world, and I would be the biggest fool. That's one of the reasons why her betrayal hurt me so much. I just couldn't believe it. Then I thought about the children. How will this affect them? I knew that children of divorced parents have problems, but children of parents who stay together can also have problems. I will need to do everything I can, if it comes down to it, to show them love and let them know that it is not their fault. A few hours later, Bridget called me. She found a counselor she liked who could see us on Wednesday at 7.30. She gave me a name and address. Okay, I'll be there. Kurt, since we have an appointment, would you like to come home so we can talk about this beforehand? We need to talk. I need to explain. I think it's best to wait until Wednesday before I get home. But Kurt, the kids are asking where you are. They need you, and I need you. Goodbye, I said and hung up. Children. She should have mentioned the children. This made me feel guilty. I wondered if it would negatively affect them that I wasn't coming home soon, but I had to stand firm. I knew that if I gave in to her now, I would lose my self-respect. The meeting was scheduled for Wednesday. What did I expect? I knew that the counselor did not have a magic pill to solve all our problems. After all, what did I want from the consultation? 1. I wanted to know why. 2. How long does this last? 3. Does she still love him? 4. Does she still love me? 5. Has she ever truly loved me? 6. Does she want to return to him? 7. The most important question for me, how can I trust her again? 7 questions. I'm sure there will be more along the way, but these 7 must be answered to my satisfaction or our marriage is doomed. That night, I lay in a hotel bed, my thoughts returning again and again to our life together. I could not understand. There was nothing I saw that could explain it. I didn't sleep much that weekend. On Monday, 
Jim came into my office and asked if I could have lunch with him. Of course, I said. Okay, I'll come by at 11.45, and we'll go to Southern Tree Steakhouse. Sounds good, I replied. My problems at home were clearly affecting my work. Jim didn't just invite me to dinner. We sat down at the restaurant, and after we ordered, Jim said, tell me. I looked at him. Don't look at me like that. We've been working together for 15 years. What's going on? I looked down at the table and muttered, she's cheating on me. What? I can't believe it. Are you sure? I have pictures. Not graphic, but obviously there's more to it than just kissing. Damn, I'm sorry. I still can't believe it. You guys always seemed so in love every time I saw you two together. That's what's killing me. I never saw any signs, no comments, nothing. If you told me two weeks ago that she was cheating, I would have laughed and called you crazy. I just can't understand it. What did she say? He asked. Not much, but I didn't give her much time to say anything. I'll tell you what she didn't say. She didn't say she was sorry for what she did. Not once. So, what are you going to do? I filed for divorce, and she has already been served with the papers. I needed her to understand the seriousness of the situation. My divorce lawyer suggested we go to counseling, so we're going to see a psychologist on Wednesday night. That's probably sound advice. Try to find out as much as you can. Maybe you can work things out. Yes, maybe, I said uncertainly. Can I give you some wisdom from my own experience? He asked. Certainly. As you know, I divorced my first wife about 10 years ago. She cheated on me too, but to be honest, it wasn't all her fault. I was so focused on my company that I didn't give her time. I put her in second place in my life. Your spouse does not want to be second in your life. I realized this too late. She tried to hint to me and then directly said that I should pay more attention to our relationship, but I did not listen. If I could do it all over, I would definitely make time for her. Even now, if she came back to me and asked me to start over, I would try my best. But that won't happen. She got married again, and as far as I know, he makes her happy. My second wife was a mistake. I always wanted her to be like my first wife, and she could not live up to my expectations. So here I am, approaching 50, going home to an empty house because I'm still looking for someone like my first wife and never finding her. I thought about his words and then said, Thank you. Don't give up your marriage just to try to find someone like your wife, he said, staring into space. It's an old saying, but with a personal perspective. You'd be better off with or without her. I didn't want to admit it, but I knew the answer. That night, I called JJ. Hey, Dad, where are you coming home, were his first words. I don't know, JJ. I'm meeting your mom tomorrow night. Yes, she told me that she had a meeting for a while and asked me to look after the children. Of course, I agreed. You're a wonderful son, JJ. I love you. I love you too, Dad. Can you pass the phone to Jeremy and Jennifer? Of course. I'll bring them now. When Jeremy answered the phone, he asked, Hey, Dad, where are you coming back from the conference? JJ told me you were at the conference but didn't know how long. What's the conference, Dad? So my eldest son covered for us. He knew we were in trouble but didn't want to upset his siblings. Again, this boy was smart beyond his years. I'm not sure either, but I'll let you know as soon as I figure it out, I told him. This seemed to calm him down. We chatted for a bit, and I told him I loved him. Then his sister wanted to talk to me. Hey, Jennifer, how are you, honey? I asked. Oh, I'm fine, she said. She then started telling me about her day at school. Oh, the innocence of a small child, oblivious to the problems around her. It was refreshing. I could listen to it all evening. Then I heard her mom come into the room and ask who she was talking to. Dad, was her answer. Okay, but it's bath night, so you'll have to say goodbye to daddy and come with me. Okay, bye, dad. I love you. I love you too, honey. JJ turned back to the phone. Dad. We all miss you. I hope you come home soon. 
Thank you, son. I love and miss you all too. I'll be back soon, don't worry. I knew, or rather hoped, that this would happen. We just needed to find a solution to this problem and set some rules. When I hung up, I received a message from Bridget, you could have called me. I would have let you talk to them. I just replied, okay. On Wednesday evening, I walked into the consultant's office around 7.15. He looked nice. I hoped this meeting would be productive. I had to admit to myself that I really wanted to go home. I waited in the lobby, sitting on the couch. A couple of minutes later, Bridget came in. She smiled at me, and I loved that smile. It always lifted my spirits when she did it. She sat down in a chair. I wasn't sure if she was trying to avoid making me feel uncomfortable by not sitting next to me on the couch or if she felt the distance between us. A few minutes later, the consultant left his office. I'm sure she noticed how we chose our seats. Her name was Dr. Mary Swift. She was about the same age as us, maybe a little older. She was nice and asked us to sit on the sofa. We both sat down, leaving about a foot and a half between us. Kurt, I want to be honest with you and tell you that I already had a session with Bridget on Monday. She told me a little about the situation. First of all, I want to say that my goal is to save your marriage. What I need from you is your willingness to cooperate. I nodded. Okay. What do you want to achieve in these sessions? Realizing that Bridget had already made her point, I said bluntly, somewhat hostily, I want to know why my wife of 15 years cheated on me with her ex-boyfriend. At this point, I pulled out the photo from my email. Okay, I think we can get some answers to that question. Is there anything else? Yes, I have a list, but the most important thing is, if we stay married, how can I trust her again? As I emphasize the if, I noticed Bridget tense up. I understand. We can work on that, the consultant said. From talking to your wife, I have to say that two aspects of her personality stand out. The first is her honesty, she doesn't lie. That will be very helpful in these sessions and will help you trust her again. I nodded. The second is that promises mean a lot to her. This can also help in reconciliation, but it can also be a stumbling block. I nodded again. Bridget, it seemed to you that Kurt was not letting you explain yourself. Kurt, are you ready to sit quietly and let her explain? Of course, I said sharply. Okay, Bridget, continue. First, I want to say that I love you, Kurt. If you asked yourself, you would have to honestly answer that you know I love you. Next, I want to say that I am sorry for hurting you. I was about to interrupt her and ask if she regretted what she did, but the counselor saw what I was about to say and said, Kurt, please give her time. I sighed heavily and nodded. Bridget continued, Kurt, the man in the photo, as you know, was my high school sweetheart. We were in love. We tried to maintain a long-distance relationship through college, but by the end of the first year, we both realized it wouldn't last, so we broke up before we started the second year. I think we were both broken. The doctor intervened and asked, that was almost 20 years ago. What happened to bring us to this point? Bridget continued, Gary couldn't make it to our 15-year reunion, but he got the class list with my married name on it. He found me on Facebook, and we started talking again. Facebook? I interrupted. I've seen many marriages ruined because of that damn site. People don't see the real person, only the persona they want to show or the memories they keep from the past. Romantic encounters rarely last long, leaving behind pieces of broken hearts. The consultant said, Sorry, I don't want to get up on my podium. Please continue, Bridget. So, three years ago, the company I work for was looking to expand to the West. Gary was unhappy with his previous job, and I told him about a regional representative position that was opening up. He applied and has been working there ever since. So he's in Denver and you're here. How did this happen? I asked, pointing to the photo. Bridget's shoulders sagged. Every quarter, all the regional representatives have to come to the company's headquarters in Chicago for three days. That's where we started meeting and communicating again. The doctor watched me carefully while Bridget spoke. She noticed my physical reaction when Bridget said they had started talking again. I was heartbroken. 
I'd like to give Kurt the opportunity to ask you one question at this time. Go ahead, Kurt. So this has been going on for three years? I asked. Kurt, you know I won't lie to you. Believe me when I say no. For the first year, we stayed professional. We hung out as friends. Then, two years ago, we started holding hands when we went out to dinner. I went limp on the couch. Bridget noticed the change in my mood and then said, But Kurt, I love you. You're my husband. We'll be together forever. Then how could you do this? I screamed. Every three months, you go away for three days to do this, and then you come back to your poor, unsuspecting husband? It's not like that, she insisted. You keep saying that. Are you saying that he hasn't slept with you every three months for the last two years? No, he didn't sleep with me. We shared tender moments with each other. This is even worse. Do you love him? Kurt, he was my first love. We had a special connection. We promised each other that we would always be there for each other whenever possible. So being there for each other means letting him have you when you're together, right? It didn't take anything away from you. Didn't you feel loved before I left for meetings? Didn't you feel loved? Didn't we make love those nights like always? How did it take something away from you? Kurt, you know that I love you. I'm always here for you and the kids when you need me. You have to admit it, I don't love you, that I don't respect you. This was the promise I made to you on our wedding day, love, respect, and appreciate until death. I have never regretted loving you, marrying you, having children with you, sharing my life with you. Finding your heart, you know I'm telling the truth. My time away once a quarter took nothing away from you. I never gave you my all. I couldn't believe what she was saying. Did she justify her cheating because I wasn't there, so it didn't take anything away from me? What about our wedding vows? What about abandoning everyone else? Bridget, you're talking about our wedding vows. What about denying all the others? What about this promise to me in front of all our friends and family? Kurt, I know this will hurt you, but those words weren't in our vows. Watch the DVD. I did this two years ago when I was struggling with my conflicting promises and emotions. The priest didn't include those words, and no, I didn't ask him not to include them. So don't blame me for that. So because the priest missed it when he said the vows, that justifies your adultery? It allowed me to keep my promise to Gary, which I made before I even met you. Then the consultant intervened. Kurt, Bridget, our time is almost up for this session. I think before anything is said that you might regret later, we should end this here. I have a task for both of you. I want you both to write down what you think is important in a good relationship and bring them with you for the next week. Don't consult each other. I want you both to see what the other considers important in any relationship. We left without saying a word to each other. Of course, I didn't come home that week. I called the children every evening. I called Bridget's phone but there was no point in making the situation worse by deliberately ignoring her. When I spoke to her, I was polite but didn't spend much time talking to her before asking to talk to the kids. When the next Wednesday arrived, we were back in the consultant's office waiting for our appointment. I spent a lot of time on my list. I tried to be concise, so I formatted it as a list of bullet points to fit everything on one page. Bridget had a notebook with at least 10 pages filled out. This could have been a long, long meeting. When Mary, the consultant, came out to invite us, we stood up, and I let her go ahead. As we sat down, this time at opposite ends of the couch, Mary said, Okay, I don't want to discuss the past this week. I want to discuss your thoughts. I hope each of you shared your thoughts on what makes a good relationship. We both nodded. Who would like to start first? Well, Kurt seems to have a shorter list, so let's start there, Bridget said in a tone I had rarely heard from her. Mary commented, Bridget, Kurt's list, if I'm reading it correctly, probably consists of individual words that he can explain. Just because your list is probably written in sentence form doesn't make his list any less important. Wow, she put Bridget in her place. Bridget was a little taken aback but nodded to Mary anyway. Kurt, why don't you start? And if you'll allow me, I'd like to ask questions so we can understand what you're trying to convey. 
Of course, I said, unfolding my piece of paper and began reading the list. Love, I said. I don't want to interrupt you right away, Kurt, but Bridget asked a question last week that I think is related to this. Is it okay to ask it again now? Certainly, I said. She asked, have you ever felt like I didn't love you, didn't respect you, or didn't value you? Can you answer this question now? I hesitated. Well, until three weeks ago, I would have said never. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that she loved me. Now, I have my doubts. Bridget was about to say something, but Mary interrupted her, saying, Okay, thank you for your honesty. Hopefully, through these consultations, we can eliminate these doubts. Next, respect. What do you mean? Mary asked. Don't put each other down, especially in front of other people. Children understand that I work hard to provide for our family, I explained. I looked at Bridget and added, so is she? I understand why this might be important, Mary said. If a person doesn't respect her partner, it can lead to emotional trauma. Do you think she respects you? Yes, she has always been respectful, except for that day when she spoke to me like a child, demanding that I come home immediately. I looked at Bridget. Her face was slightly red. I wasn't sure if it was out of embarrassment or anger. So in over 15 years together, she's almost always shown you respect? Yes, it was, in fact. It's one of the things I'm proud of. I've seen other wives humiliate their husbands in public, and it infuriated me. I felt sorry for those husbands. Bridget smiled when I said I was proud of her. Okay, carry on. Commitment. Mary nodded but didn't say anything. Patience. What do you mean by that? Be willing to be patient when I don't do things the way she would like or within her time frame. Fine. Forgiveness. This is an important point. Marriages I see often depend on this. Here's my question for you. Are you ready to think about trying to forgive Bridget? I know you may not be ready to forgive her now, but would you consider trying? I sat in silence for a minute. Bridget was starting to get nervous. When I put this on my list, I knew that if we were going to survive, I would have to forgive her. I thought long and hard about this. Now, when the counselor asked me directly if I could try to forgive her, I hesitated. The problem with forgiveness is that if you forgive someone, you have to be willing to open yourself up again and risk being hurt. Am I ready for this? I can try, I said. That's all you can ask for, she said. Continue. Honesty. Tell me, do you consider your wife an honest person? I looked at Bridget. She looked straight at me, wanting to know if I believed her, if I knew that everything she said about her love for me, about not wanting a divorce, about the fact that she does everything for me, is true. Yeah, she's honest. I've never known her to lie. Even when I confronted her, she didn't try to lie her way out of a situation. You heard about her last week. In fact, she can be brutally honest sometimes. Mary nodded her head. What's next? Trust. We will return to this in future sessions. It will take a lot of time and effort. I am telling you both now, this is the main point. It may take several months to regain trust and it may take several years if there's no forgiveness first. I nodded and saw Bridget lower her head. Okay, what's next? Good communication. Are you talking to each other honestly? I think that's one of our strengths. We've always been able to talk about everything. That's also the reason why it hurts so much. She didn't tell me what she was thinking about her dilemma. I looked at Bridget again. Her head was still lowered. Okay, we'll get to that later. What's next? Dedication. What do you mean by that? Be willing to do things for your partner, even if they're not what you want to do, but they're important to her. Mary nodded again. Okay, what's next? Only one item left on my list, I said. Physical intimacy. Okay. What level were you at with this before all this? I don't have a problem with that. She's always ready. I know so many other men who say their wives are stingy with it, only giving when they want something from their husband. We've been together for over 15 years, and that's all. It still feels like a honeymoon. I looked at Bridget again. 
She blushed with embarrassment, but her smile couldn't have been bigger. God, how I love that smile. Mary looked at us and then said, Kurt, Bridget, our time is almost up, but we are making such good progress today. Can you stay for one more session? Bridget picked up her phone and said, Let me call home and let our son know we'll be about an hour late. She called, and then Mary said, Okay, Bridget, it's your turn. What do you have? First of all, let me say that I appreciate your list, Kurt. I'm sorry if I belittled its importance because of its length. I hope you hear my list and realize that I truly love you, and you are already doing many of these things. It made me feel good. I was glad to hear what she had to say. The first thing is what you're already great at, telling and showing that you love me. I knew you loved me even before you first said it years ago. Mary nodded and smiled. The second is understanding and forgiveness. I know this is something we will work on with Mary's help. I hope you will try to forgive me. Mary spoke up. Bridget, at the risk of ruining our progress, I need to ask you a question. What is it? Bridget said nervously. I know this is only our second time together, but there is a huge elephant in the room, and we need to address it now, while you're on the subject. Okay, Bridget said cautiously. Understand, my goal is to save your marriage. With that in mind, I have heard that you want understanding and forgiveness, but I have not yet heard you ask for it. Bridget, do you regret what you did? Bridget lowered her head. I knew you would ask this question at some point. I struggled with the answer. She looked at me, our eyes met, and I saw tears. I'm sorry that what I did hurt my husband and our relationship, but I'm not sorry for what I did. I was keeping a promise to someone who means a lot to me. I helped him as best I could, I know it hurts to hear, but I hope you can understand where I'm coming from. I hope you can forgive me for what I did, hurting you while helping someone else. At that moment, I stood up. She doesn't regret what she did. She would still be doing this if they hadn't sent me that letter. Hell, she'd probably still do it to make good on her promise to help him as best she could. This was a defining moment for me. I need a promise that this will never happen again. I looked at the consultant. She saw that I was on the verge of an explosion and said, let's leave it at that. The emotions are too raw to continue. I think she was surprised by what my wife said. Sounds good to me, I said sharply. Bridget, are you willing to stay a little longer to discuss this one-on-one? -on -one? Yes, she said, starting to cry. Kurt, can I see you one-on-one -on -one until next Wednesday? Of course. I'll call you to make an appointment, I said, leaving the office. Well, looks like I won't be coming home this week either, I thought. I began to doubt that I would return at all. The next day at work, everyone tried to stay away from me. I hated bringing my problems to work but I couldn't get her words out of my head. That evening, sitting on my motel bed, I opened my laptop and went to Facebook. Elizabeth Jones accepted my friend request. I sent her a private message asking her to call me with her phone number. I didn't know how often she checked her Facebook or if she had notifications on her phone, so I waited for her to call. A few minutes later, I received a reply message. She was just sitting down to dinner but would call after. Oh yes. She's two hours behind us, I thought. Well, I'll wait. About an hour and a half later, she called me. Hello, I said. Hi, this is Liz. Did you ask me to call? Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you, maybe fill in some gaps I have and hopefully fill in some gaps you might have. Okay, she said with some uncertainty. I don't know how much you know, so I'll just tell you what I know. I told her everything I knew when that Bridget had said Gary needed her help because of intimacy issues in their marriage. We do it maybe once every two weeks because he's always too tired or not in the mood. I began to suspect he had a medical problem, and then I received these photos. I was furious. I told him he had to quit his job if he wanted to save our marriage. In light of what you just said, I can still file for divorce. He's lucky I didn't throw him out of the house when I received this letter. She was a spark. So Gary lied to my wife. If they were as close as Bridget's mother described, he would know of her need to always keep her promises. He took advantage of this somehow. I needed to convey the truth to Bridget about her ex-boyfriend. Liz, can I ask you a favor? What is it? 
then I'll tell you if I can do it. Bridget and I are going through counseling. I don't know if there's hope for us right now, but when I think there's hope, could you call me when we're in the counselor's office? I want Bridget to hear from you what you just told me. It could be what opens her eyes to their relationship. Of course, I can do that. Where are your consultations? Wednesday evenings. Unfortunately, that's dinner time for you. I'll order pizza and have it delivered that night. That way, I won't have to worry about cooking. I really appreciate it. It could be a couple more weeks. We have big hurdles to overcome before I feel like we're on the road to recovery. Well, I'll wait for your call or Facebook message. We hung up, and I thought about what I had just learned. This will ruin Bridget's relationship with her ex-boyfriend, but it will go a long way towards saving our marriage. The salvation of our marriage, however, depended on her willingness to see that what she had done had destroyed my faith in our relationship. If a promise made 20 years ago was more important than our marriage, I'd rather take a chance with a new wife, one who may not be as perfect as her, but who I can trust. Someone who won't think that it didn't take anything away from me when I was with him. The phone call gave me hope, finally, a way out of this situation. Hearing what Liz said, will this be Bridget's moment of truth? Will she finally see the light? I thought about what I wanted to know going into the consultation. After just two weeks, I figured out almost everything. One, why? Because her ex is a creep and used her good nature against her. Two, how long? Two years. Every three months for three days. I'm sure it was at least twice a day, so six times every quarter. Four times a year, that's 24 times a year. In two years, that's 48 times. Three, could I survive this? Four, does she love him? She won't after she finds out what he did to her. She despises people who lie for personal gain. Five, does she love me? Yes, I know she does. Six, does she want to stay with him? No, especially after she finds out that he was willing to lie to her to get her into bed. So the only question that remains is number seven, how can I ever trust her again? I'm sure the consultant will help with this. It might take time, but I knew that eventually, I would be able to trust her again, maybe not 100% as before, but still trust her. On Monday, I left work early to go to a meeting with a consultant. Kurt, can I ask you a question? Certainly. I've never seen anything like this in all my years of practice. Bridget has a very strong need to keep all her promises. Has she always been like this? As long as I've known her. This worries me. A person with this trait can put herself in serious danger just to keep a promise. Have you ever known someone who didn't keep a promise to her? She asked. I hadn't thought about it before. Yeah, her college friend. They were best friends. What happened? It was our senior year. Gina was her best friend. They were planning to go to Cancun for spring break. They had been planning it since September. Bridget bought the plane tickets and made all the reservations. Everything was ready. In January, Gina met a guy she really liked. By March, she was crazy about him. When he told her he wanted to go skiing in Vail, she immediately agreed. When she returned home to their apartment and told Bridget three weeks before spring break that she wouldn't be going to Cancun, Bridget freaked out. She ended her friendship with her best friend, and they no longer spoke. We ended up going to Cancun together, so it wasn't all in vain, but she never forgave her. This is what I expected. Someone close to her had to break a promise to her, and it has affected her negatively ever since, the doctor said. I replied, this fact may be useful to me in this situation. What do you have in mind? She asked. I'll tell you once we solve the bigger problem. What do you mean by bigger problem? How can I make her understand that what she did was wrong? I don't think you'll ever make her understand, Kurt. In her mind, she wasn't taking anything away from you by keeping her promise. You weren't there, so she didn't take up your time. Also, you weren't there, so she didn't take away your love. In her mind, she still loved you and, in fact, still loves you with all her heart. What she did didn't take any of that love away from you. So for the rest of my life, I will have to think about whether there are still some promises that will allow her to cheat? I asked. That would be a good question for her. 
Are there any other promises that will make her betray your trust again? If she thinks about it and cannot find such promises, then ask her to promise not to betray you in this way again. It was a lot of information to think about. I knew Bridget's attitude towards promises, but is that an excuse for cheating? The doctor noticed that I was deep in thought and said, Can I put this in a different light for you? Of course, I said. Anything to figure it out. Let's say you knew someone who needed a blood transfusion and they had a rare blood type. You also had this rare blood type. Would you be willing to give them some of your blood, knowing that your body will produce more and you will be fine? Certainly. So that's exactly how Bridget saw it. She was giving away something she had that he needed, and she would be fine after that. It wouldn't affect her negatively. Now my head was spinning. I couldn't make sense of it all. However, she did have a good guess about Bridget's thoughts. Will this be enough for me? Will I be able to forgive her because of her worldview, knowing that she loves me and I love her? Will that be enough? Part of me wanted to say yes, but another part wanted her to be punished for betraying our marriage. Damn, why can't life be simple? I left her office more confused than when I arrived, but I also had some ideas that I never would have thought of on my own. Should I treat her problems as a mental disorder? If that were the case, it would definitely make it easier to accept and even forgive her. I had a lot to think about. Mary and I talked about Bridget's other personality traits. I know Mary probably had some reservations about discussing Bridget and the things discussed in the private session, but her main goal was to save our marriage. Any information she could give to both of us to facilitate reconciliation would help achieve this goal. I told her that Bridget's attitude of honesty had always been a blessing, giving me confidence that my wife was faithful to me when she made her rounds as a regional representative. I knew that she belonged to me and only me. I told Mary, I know it sounds primitive, but it's not because just as she was mine, I was hers. I'm not the most handsome guy in the world, but some women are looking for security. I have a stable job and I treat people with respect. I was flirted with and even propositioned, but I always remained firm, knowing that for both of us, for Bridget and me, there was no one else. Now this is in question. I'm not sure I can trust her to continue this work. I understand, Kurt, and we will work on trust. Let's get you two back together first. As I sat there, I thought about the call from Liz. Hey Doc, I think I might have a way to help with this, which I told her about what Liz and I wanted to do. I told her it would help me in my quest to forgive and trust Bridget again. She agreed, and I told her I would call her the next day to confirm that Liz would be able to make the call. When I arrived at the motel, I turned on my laptop and sent a Facebook message to Liz to call me when she had a chance. At 10 p.m., she called me. Hey, Kurt. I was already planning on calling you this evening when I got your message on Facebook. Thanks for calling, Elizabeth. Liz, please. Okay, Liz. What were you going to call me about? I thought this Tuesday would be the day to call. I also had an idea of how we could help both of our situations. Okay, whatever I can do, I will do. We discussed her idea, and if it worked, it would probably ruin the relationship, at least between Bridget and Gary. I really hoped this would work. I also told her about the consultant's observations, and I actually heard the compassion in her voice when she said, Well, I hope you can make things work. I hoped so too, I said. I kept thinking about what the owner of my company said. I wondered if I divorced her, would I always be looking for a replacement just like her at work? I was able to separate my personal life and work life so that it didn't affect me too much, but I definitely wasn't being myself. On Wednesday night, I was in the consultant's office at 7.15. I was as nervous as a guy at prom. I really hoped the plan would work. At 7.25, Bridget came in. I could tell she made a special effort to look the part for our meeting. I was sitting on the sofa, and she also sat on the sofa. Of course, there was a gap between us, but we sat next to each other. Kurt, she said, can you come home? The children are starting to get out of control. I think they are starting to doubt the conference explanation. They just want you to come home. To make her understand how unstable the situation was, I said, after last Thursday's revelations, I don't know if I'll ever go back. I paused, looked at her, and said emotionlessly, we'll see how this evening goes. Kurt, 
Don't say that, she said. You know I love you. I knew this, but I need to reprimand her. If I had known that, we wouldn't be here. I was hoping this evening might be a turning point. We'll see, I said. At that moment, Mary came out and took us from the reception area. She could see that we were both nervous, but for different reasons. As we sat down on the sofa again at opposite ends, Mary began to talk to us. Bridget, Kurt, from our individual meetings, I can tell that you both love each other very much, but love is not enough. Bridget, Kurt needs to trust you right now. In his mind, he can't trust you, at least not when it comes to Gary. I dare say he probably can't trust you about anything, at least not at the moment. In his head, he wonders what other promises could be waiting to ruin your marriage forever. Kurt, Bridget needs understanding and forgiveness from you. If you can't forgive her, then there's no point in continuing. She needs to know that you are willing to try, that you see a moment when you can forgive her. Trust me, she knows she hurt you. We both looked at each other, not knowing what to say. Bridget, we didn't finish your list last week, Mary said. She looked at me. Before you left, I'd like you to continue, but be open to what Kurt might say or do today to gain more understanding. Bridget hesitated and said, okay. I think the next thing on my list, as well as Kurt's, is communication. I mean real communication, not just how was your day, but thoughts about his hopes, dreams, goals, and fears. Let him share with me, and I will share with him too. We communicate well, but I think we need more, especially now. This way, we can understand each other better. At that moment, my phone rang. Bridget looked at me with a dissatisfied expression on her face. I raised my finger and answered the call immediately, putting it on speaker but muting us so that any noise we made wouldn't get through. Kurt, what are you doing? We're in a meeting, Bridget said angrily. Please listen, and maybe it will help us, I said. She looked puzzled. Then we heard a voice on the phone. Gary. I ordered the kids pizza tonight because we need to talk. I need you to tell me again what happened and why I shouldn't just throw you out on the street. I spoke with a lawyer. She assured me that I would definitely get custody of the children and would be able to stay in the house as long as you pay all the expenses. I want you to be honest with me. If I find out that you have not been honest, I will file for divorce. Bridget looked at me. She had a deer caught in the headlights look on her face. Like I said, her name is Bridget. She was my high school sweetheart. So how did you end up kissing and hugging in the hotel hallway? Gary asked. Well, after our last class reunion, someone on the committee sent everyone who couldn't attend a register of all our classmates with their married names. So I found her on Facebook and we started messaging each other. So far, everything he said matched what Bridget had told me. Their stories had not yet diverged. Liz then asked, so you told her you'd be in Chicago, and she met you there last month? Gary responded sharply, no. About three years ago, she told me that the company she works for was looking to expand into Colorado and was looking for regional representatives like her. So that's why you took this job, to sleep with your ex-girlfriend? Liz asked. No, Gary said. She begged me to apply, saying that we could see each other every three months for three days. At that moment, I looked at Bridget. She was just looking at the phone. Liz continued, so she told you that if you got a job, you could sleep with her every three months? Not in those exact words, but she meant it, he said. I looked at Bridget. She was still looking at the phone, but shaking her head. So you slept with her every three months for the last three years? Liz accused. No, I swear I refused the whole time. But six months ago, she painted me into a corner. She said that if I didn't sleep with her, she would tell you that we were having an affair the whole time I was working there. I didn't want to do this. I told her I loved you and that she should find one of the other unmarried representatives to have an affair with. Honey, you have to believe me, I didn't mean to do this. I have no feelings for her, that's why I ended my relationship with her when we were in college. Now I just want her to leave me alone and let me do my job. In these meetings, she was possessive when we were together, always jealous of any girl who said hi to me in the hallway. I'm telling you, she's crazy and needs to see a psychiatrist. I was really afraid she might hurt me and ruin our marriage. 
I wish we could confront her, but she would just lie and probably say I was the one stalking her. You have to believe me, she can't be trusted. I'm glad I'm looking for another job so I never have to see her again. I can't stand it anymore. I was looking at Bridget the whole time. Her expression changed from disbelief to confusion and then to anger. Eventually, she started screaming at the phone, you idiot liar. Son of a, tell the truth, you idiot. I picked up the phone and ended the call. I looked at Bridget, and she covered her face with her hands. She was crying. I know it sounds cruel, but I needed to know, I said. Are you crying because he lied or because he told the truth? She continued to cry for a while and then said, I'm crying because I ruined our marriage, possibly forever, over a piece of crap that I once cared about. How could he say such things? Kurt, you have to believe me. I never begged him to come work there. I also definitely did not hint or even suggest that I wanted to sleep with him. Then she looked me straight in the eyes. Kurt, you know that I have never lied to you. I'm telling you now that I didn't do these things. I refused his attempts until he told me that he was not getting intimacy from his wife. You have to believe me. I struggled with this decision, but I promised him this was for comfort only and only during quarterly meetings. Kurt, it didn't take anything away from you. I had no thoughts about us getting back together. I love you. Kurt, you have to believe me. She begged. She was desperately trying to convince me while simultaneously dealing with the betrayal of someone she thought cared about her in any way. How much of what he said was true? How much was his impression of events? How much was a lie to cover himself? Unless my wife had been playing with me since I met her, I had to believe that her trait of being honest was not an act. I could believe her. I knew that in her mind she was helping the man she once loved while also fulfilling her other quality of keeping her promises. So where do we go next, Bridget? I asked. Kurt, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm sorry that I took your love for granted. I'm sorry that I put my past promise before our marriage. What if he comes back and gets divorced, needing comfort again? Let him go to hell, I said. Kurt, can you forgive me? I'm so sorry that I hurt you. From now on, you will be in first place, even in front of the children. Of course, there'll be a close second, she said, smiling at me. We both knew that children were the most important in our lives. Mary, who had been silent throughout the conversation, turned to me. Kurt, what do you think? Can you forgive her? Can you trust her? Is there anything else you need to trust her again? I thought about this a lot. I knew exactly what I wanted to say. I turned to Bridget. I need to be able to trust you. I love you, Kurt, she declared. I continued, first, I want you to go to our family doctor and ask for an STD test. If she asks why, tell her the truth. Bridget looked at me, and I could see the shock on her face at what I was asking. I was asking her to confide in a woman she had known since she got her first period, the person who answered all her women's health questions she was embarrassed to ask her mother. A man who probably felt more like a grandmother to her than a doctor. She looked deeply into my eyes, which were filled with tears, and nodded. Secondly, I want you to promise to never see him again, ever. She thought for a minute and said, Kurt, I can't promise that. I started to get up, getting ready to leave. No, Kurt, wait, she said. I can't promise that because his family still lives in this city. I'm sure there will be times when he will come to visit them. I might accidentally run into him in a store or something. I thought about it. Okay, I understand. How about you don't go where you know he'll be? She thought again. Kurt, there will be reunions and, God forbid, funerals of friends and classmates. I don't think that's possible. How about I don't go where I think he might be without you? Not for funerals, not for alumni reunions. I thought about it. It was like Bridget to think things through before promising anything, especially now. Okay, I accept it, she said. I told her one more thing, so that I can trust you, I want you to quit your job. Kurt, Mary said, may I intervene? I looked at her, not sure what she was thinking, but nodded. Do you have a dog? I looked at her, puzzled by such a strange question. 
Um, yeah. Is she indoor or outdoor? She's mostly an indoor dog, but of course, we let her outside from time to time. So you just let her wander? No, our backyard is fenced in. Is the backyard fenced in? Yes. What does this have to do with it? Bear with me. Why is your backyard fenced in? So she doesn't run away, I said. So you don't trust her to stay around? You're actually trusting the fence to keep her in? I nodded slowly. Demanding that she quit her job means you don't trust her not to run away. I sighed. Yes, I guess. Okay, then I'll go with her to Chicago for her meetings. So you want to put a leash on her like you would on your dog? I went limp. I knew I had to decide whether to take the risk or not. What would our relationship be like if I had to follow her 24-7 or track her location by phone or hire a private investigator to follow her? Kurt, I love you. From the moment I met you, I knew I would love you forever. Please, let's get through this. Don't give up on us, she begged, tears in her eyes. Damn it, I thought. I hated her for what she did to us, but I knew I loved her too. My boss's words began to swirl in my head. Don't give up on your marriage just so you can try to find someone like her. So I didn't refuse. That night, I returned to the motel to get my things, not to stay. I was back home forever. We continued to see a consultant who worked with me on trust issues, with Bridget on setting boundaries and making good decisions, even when it came to making promises. She also worked with both of us to strengthen our relationship. I stopped the divorce process. I decided that I was committed to this relationship. We talked more over the next few weeks than we had in years. In counseling sessions, I learned about other things on Bridget's relationship list. Many of them were similar to mine, but there were two that I hadn't thought of. One was the expression of affection, both verbal and physical, but not just in the bedroom. The other was quality time, date nights, of course, but also truly being together when we were in the same room, creating a physical and emotional connection. A few weeks passed, and my hands were no longer helping. However, when I took out the box of protection, she almost tore my head off. I told her it was either these or we wait until she got her test results. Take your pick. Fortunately, she agreed. A week later, the results came back negative. Bridget did quit her job, but not right away. Gary wasn't there for the next quarterly meeting, he actually quit. Liz, even though she knew he lied, gave him another chance that night but kept him on a very short leash. Since Gary was away, some of the other regional representatives and even some of the office staff tried to flirt with her, thinking she was open to it because of what she had with Gary. She told me about this when she returned. I told her she should talk to HR, but she said she couldn't because she was sure it was someone from HR who sent me the email. If she tried to report harassment, the affair would come to light, and she didn't want that to follow her. She left soon after, taking a job as a sales representative for a local company. In the future, we continued to work on our relationship. There were times when I felt melancholy thinking about what happened. When she noticed these moments, Bridget would say something like, Kurt, you always had my love. It didn't take anything away from you. Over time, such moments became less frequent. Our life returned to normal. I loved her and the children, and I knew she loved me too. It would be great if the story ended there. However, eight or nine years after the event that almost destroyed my marriage, things began to change. Bridget and I were approaching 40, and as happens with time, the frequency of our lovemaking decreased. Much of this was due to the onset of menopause. Bridget simply didn't have the same desire. At first, I was worried that maybe she was cheating on me again. You know what they say, once a cheater, always a cheater. I started checking her phone for unknown calls or messages, keeping track. I even installed a tracking app on her phone. Nothing. I didn't find anything. So one day, I asked her, Bridget, is everything okay? What do you mean? She asked. Between us. Yes, Kurt, I love you now as much as I always have. Why do you ask? Well, we just don't seem to connect like we used to. She looked at me. I swear, this woman could read my mind. It has to do with intimacy, doesn't it? I hesitated and finally said, yes. 
We used to do it all the time, but now I'm lucky if we do it once a week. Kurt, you know we're not 20-year-olds anymore. My body is going through changes. I just don't have the same desire as before. This is the most terrible change. My life will never be the same. We talked about it, and although I wasn't happy, I had to accept it. I promised not to push her, and she agreed to spend every Saturday night with me unless one of us was sick. The time we spent together became somewhat mandatory. Our life settled into a more routine direction. We worked during the day and watched TV in the evening. Saturday night became date night, and I got my obligatory intimacy. When football season started, we made a deal. We would watch a reality show on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and football on Mondays and Thursdays. It worked until one Thursday when a reality show came on that she simply had to watch. Kurt, I want to watch my reality show. Honey, I said, you know Thursday is football night. Yes, but this is a special evening. Please, she begged. I sighed. Okay, you can watch. I'll just go to Bear Creek and watch the game there. I didn't want to argue with her. Bear Creek is our city's sports bar, so I started spending Thursday nights there. One Thursday, the game was not interesting at all, so I started watching hockey. I really enjoyed it, and the Predators played great. The following week, on Monday night, I was about to watch the game when Bridget came over and said, Can we watch my shows? It's Monday, football night, I replied. Wouldn't it be better to watch in a bar with other fans? She asked. So you'd rather have me watch at the bar than at home with you? You'll enjoy it more, and then I can watch more of my shows, she said. She was right. I would enjoy it more. Although I enjoyed spending time with Bridget, she wasn't really into football, so I stood up, kissed her goodbye, and walked back to Bear Creek. I sat there, torn between a football game and a hockey match. When Thursday came, I didn't even sit down to watch the game, I just said, I'm going to Bear Creek for a beer and to watch the games. She said, okay, have a nice time. I think she was glad I wouldn't be around harassing her and forcing her to watch football. One Monday, while watching the game, I heard a familiar voice say, hey Kurt, nice to see someone familiar here. Can I watch the game with you? Of course, sit down, I replied. It was Terry from work. We talked, watched the games, cheered against the referees and cheered for our team. It was a good evening. When I got home, Bridget asked how watching the game was. Okay, actually. Terry from work saw me and joined me. We talked, shouted at the refs, and cheered for our team. It was fun. It was great to have someone to watch the game with. She said, we started watching games together every Monday and Thursday night, so this became our new routine. I would come home, have dinner, watch TV, and on Mondays and Thursdays around 7, I would say, I'm going to have a beer and watch the games. In June, our company celebrated its 30th anniversary. We hadn't had a party since our 20th, so there were a lot of new faces and everyone had name tags. It wasn't a formal event, but we had appetizers, wine, and dancing. I was now the director of operations, so I interacted with all the employees and their families. That's where the story began. I grabbed a glass of wine and a drink for Bridget when I turned and saw my wife talking to Terry. I walked towards them. As I approached, I heard my wife, looking at Terry's name tag, say, Terry, how do you pronounce your last name? Most people call me Terry, and the last name is a buyer, like I'm going to grab a beer. Bridget turned and saw me, and then she hit me in the face hard. Four months later, sitting in Mary's office, I went through it again for probably the eighth time. Terry and I started watching games together at Bear Creek every Monday and Thursday. A few weeks later, Terry said, Why are we sitting here and paying high prices for beer on Thursday? Grab a six-pack and watch the game at my house. Terry's daughter left for college in August, and Terry went to Bear Creek because she was lonely being in the house alone. She lost her husband five years ago in a car accident and had devoted her time to raising her daughter. As a teenager, one of the things she missed was spending time with her husband watching sporting events, which they both enjoyed. She felt that watching games in a bar with other people would ease her loneliness. Then she saw me, someone she knew, and we started watching games together. So she went to the bar looking for a partner. 
Bridget said no, Terry just wanted someone to talk to and watch games with. We started watching games at her house. No, we didn't start having intimacy right away. About a month later, after we started watching games at her place, she came out of the bathroom and said, Kurt, can I ask you a favor? At that moment, I thought maybe her toilet or sink was clogged and she wanted me to fix it. I said, of course. Is there something wrong with the toilet? No, it's a bigger favor, she said. She had just spent money on a new transmission for her car, so I thought maybe she needed the money to make ends meet. I told her, sure, if it's something I can do, I'll do it. She then told me about her loneliness and how she had given up on any relationships while her daughter needed her as a teenager. What she wanted was to feel human touch again, no strings attached, no attachment, no expectations, just the human touch. Bridget, you know that I love you. It didn't take anything away from you. I was just helping her. It was something I could do to help her. Look into your heart, you know that I love you. I've always loved you from the very start. You know that I love you and the children more than anything in the world. You should know this. I'm sorry that I hurt you. I have always given you everything I have, apart from those few months when we had problems. Have you ever felt that I don't love you after all the trouble we've been through? You decide to cheat on me. How could you? I asked. Bridget, it didn't take anything away from you, I repeated. You cheated on me for six months, she accused. It was twice a week for six months. Do the math, twice a week, for times a month, six months, that's about 48 times. You spent two years twice a day, three days, for times a year for two years. That's about 48 times, I replied, accusing her. It seems we're even now. So that's why you did this, to get back at me? I thought we had this sorted out. I thought you forgave me. No, just like you, I tried to help someone in a way that I knew I could. Your excuses came back to me. I helped her, and it didn't take anything away from you. I have always been there for you. The time I spent away from you, at your insistence, took nothing away from you. Mary then chimed in, Bridget, Kurt, we've discussed this many times over the past few months. What we need to do now is get through this. You've done it before, I know you can do it again. You two love each other. This is obvious from the fact that you don't give up. Kurt, I want you to understand that you owe Bridget an apology for cheating on her. And Bridget, you also owe Kurt an apology for cheating on him. You both said you were sorry for hurting each other but not for what you did. Until you both apologize and understand that what you did was wrong, and not just the pain it caused, you will never be able to get over it. I have homework for you. I want you to go home and do something this week to show your love for each other. It doesn't have to be a grand gesture, but it should show the depth of your love. We left the office together. Our relationship was strained. We both knew we loved each other, but the pain was still there. This week, I showed my love for Bridget by sending her roses every day, and on Friday, I gave her a diamond bracelet. Of course, she loved it all and even showed her appreciation by cooking my favorite meals and showing me affection every night. On Saturday night, when I walked into the bedroom, I noticed a new decoration on the wall above our bed. I don't know where she got it, probably Amazon, Pinterest, or maybe Etsy, but it looked beautiful and showed her love. My sleep was restless. Something was bothering me. In one dream, I saw a sign on the wall that said, Hell knows no greater fury than a woman scorned. In the morning, I woke up and looked at the decoration on the wall. It was a sign with a quote from our wedding vows, to love, honor, and cherish until death do us part. Bridget's actions show how the promises of the past can destroy the present, even when intentions seem good. Kurt, faced with the pain of betrayal, faces a difficult choice, forgive or put the past behind him. But remember, trust is the foundation without which even the strongest love can crumble. Thank you for staying with us. We look forward to your comments, likes and subscriptions so as not to miss new videos. See you soon.